Hey there, Pete Erickson here, founder of Modev and the creator of the Voice and AI conference coming up September 5th through 7th in Washington, D.C. You can find out all the details on that event at voiceand.ai. This is part of our Meet the Speaker series, and I'm, I'm just having such a good time with these because I get to meet people from all around the world that uh, have all kinds of interesting jobs. And my next guest has uh, a very cool background in teaching developers uh, both how to code um, and, you know, more lately, how to use some of the latest tools uh, provided by GitHub. And many of you know about Copilot, but we're going to get into that. And um, I've always enjoyed meeting uh, developer evangelists and folks that are really experts at training uh, developers specifically, because they have a very special gift where they're at the intersection of being great teachers, but also amazing coders. And oftentimes, you know, full stack coders that really know a lot about every language. My next guest is no exception to that. I'm excited to bring up Mr. Christopher Harrison. Please welcome Christopher to the stage. Christopher, how you doing? I am not too bad. How are you? I'm good. Well, I have to say something right off the bat. When we were doing a little warm up chat here, I found out we were actually neighbors at one point <laughs> uh, or close to neighbors. I guess I had moved from the neighborhood and then you moved in. But uh, uh, tell us where you live and, uh, and a little bit about what you do. Yeah, so I uh, I currently live in Seattle, or more specifically West Seattle, uh, which ironically is south of like downtown Seattle. Yes. Um, if yeah, you're familiar yeah. with the, the 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 geography, um, but at present I'm a developer advocate at uh, GitHub, uh, focused in uh, very much on developer experience. So in particular, doing an awful lot with Code Spaces, doing an awful lot with GitHub Copilot, uh, which of course we'll uh, we'll talk about here, and really just trying to help both both companies and individuals get up and running and, and solve their problems. Uh, very cool. Yeah. So for folks out there, I used to live in Seattle. I now live in the DC area in Arlington, Virginia, but I lived in a specific neighborhood called West Seattle. And uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit, it is a bit, a bit like an island, isn't it, Christopher? Because you have to take uh, one of a couple bridges to get there or go down and around to get there. And uh, the major bridge uh, failed, I guess, and had to be rebuilt uh, and I guess that was took about two or three years, right? Yeah, it took just over two years to, to to build. It was interesting, the timing, because it was like just as we started doing all of the shutdowns and everything for COVID, and then the bridge went down. And so it was basically, now you don't have anywhere to go. And even if you did, you can't get there um, because that, yeah. that bridge is the, the major artery uh, that will get you uh, on and off of uh, off of this peninsula. So yeah, yeah, it, was, yeah, uh, no, it was an I, interesting time. Several, I've got a couple sisters out in that area as well. And uh, yeah, so just, you know, it was interesting timing, I guess, good timing for the lockdown. Let's just rebuild the bridge while we're, while we're locked down. And now it's, now it's running again. So that's great. Well, um, yep. uh, so uh, you're with GitHub. I think obviously most, uh, most developers, uh, you know, the 20 some million developers know GitHub, but most people know GitHub. Um, Tell us, though, a little bit uh, for the viewers out there. Just give us the Reader's Digest on GitHub uh, for those that may not be as familiar with GitHub. Yeah, you know, a couple of years ago, um, I heard somebody mention that the short version for GitHub is that it's like Google Docs, but for code. And I, I think to a certain extent, um, that's right, but it's not true anymore. Uh, that uh, GitHub, of course, traditionally is this is where developers will put their source code. They'll build out community. They'll they'll start open source projects. They'll continue to grow, and away they go from there. And obviously, like that's core. That's our foundation. That's 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 in our heart. That absolutely is what drives us. But we've grown and continue to add on additional functionality so that now we, of course, have GitHub Actions. So you can do all of your automation, CI, CD. We've added on GitHub Advanced Security so you can secure your pipeline. We've added on tools like Code Spaces so you can create a cloud-based container and be able to code with nothing more than a browser. And then, of course, GitHub Copilot, where now we can actually support you through that coding experience. So what started as a, hey, this is this is some place to put your code, like, that again, kind of that Google Docs for code, has really grown far beyond that and can really help support developers from, from start to finish of just like, here's where you can put your code, here's help to write your code, and then basically everything in between. It's such a different time, and GitHub clearly is kind of at the at the at the core edge of this. And I, I think that the, obviously the tools that you built are um, 
really related to where the market is. What would you say uh, the big difference is between a developer today and a developer a decade ago? And where do you think uh, a developer will be you know, in five years? Oh, gosh, that's a fantastic question. Um, Maybe it's too many questions, know, but uh, let's, talk, no. let's talk about <laughs> versus developer today. Yeah, no. So I, yeah, I, I think the biggest difference between the developer 10 years ago and the developer today is, I, I, I think there's a couple of things. I, I think the first is, and probably the most pronounced, is the breadth of knowledge that's required to be a developer today. That it used to be that you could focus in on a single language, that I could be a Python developer, that I could be a C-sharp developer, and not really have to branch out beyond that. And that's just not true anymore, that you really do need to, at the very least, to be competent in multiple languages, that even if I'm a Python developer, I very likely need to know something about Java or something about C Sharp, that uh, you know, the applications that I'm going to be building, the services that I'm going to be interacting with are very much going to require that. Uh, I think the other big difference is, you know, to a certain extent, I, I think it's almost more challenging today to be a developer than 10 years ago. And there's a certain irony in, in me saying that because obviously the tool support that we have today is far superior to what we had in, in the past, that Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, of course, have continued to grow, uh, JetBrains and, and uh, Xcode, and like all of these wonderful IDEs and all of these great frameworks like React and Django that can help support our developers, you know, allow us to do things that we really almost couldn't even dream of being able to do 10 years ago. But because of the fact that, hey, we've got all this power, the complexity in turn has increased as well, that the demands that we're seeing, the feature requests that we're seeing are far more complex than they were 10 years ago. And the environments that we're deploying out to are also far more complex that, you know, 10 years ago, I maybe had a server farm and, and a couple of databases that I was connecting to and maybe a couple of external services. And that was about it. But now I've got you know services and microservices and and very likely like multiple cloud providers that I'm having to deal with. And so that complexity that 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 we have today, I, I think is is greater than what we had ten years ago. So developers really have to be able to navigate that space as well. Yeah, I think you. I mean, I, it, it's interesting, right? So uh, you. The, the developer today isn't the specialist in a specific code, but they have to know a lot more. Like it's it's a really interesting dynamic. So um, the future of developers, I think, is very safe and intact, even though code generation is here. Um, and I think that, you know, code generation is, is going to be it's going to only accelerate. Right. Um, but where do, you, where do you where do you see this going for a developer, you know, in five years? I mean, some folks have called that, you know, develop software development will, will, you know, end. But I think there's also like folks that are saying the AI is the apocalypse. And, you know, I, <laughs> I don't think I'm there either. But I, I, I see a very bright future where we, you know, developers are going to be more needed almost than ever um, to help build and maintain products and, you know, troubleshoot. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I have a lot of, of thoughts on this. And, and this is, uh, of course, what my what my talk is, is all about. So I'm going to try and distill down a couple of, I think, very key points here, uh, when it comes to, you know, code generation and and AI. And the first of which is that while yes, this is a relatively large leap in functionality and capability uh, that we've seen very recently, we've seen these types of events constantly throughout the past. You know, I mentioned frameworks like Django and React, which take a lot of those low-level operations and abstract them away. So like, I don't necessarily have to worry about connecting out to a database manually, that I, I have these ORMs, object relational mappers, that are available to me. I, I don't have to worry about always running a lot of low-level JavaScript, that I have frameworks like React that will uh, uh, obfuscate all of that away. And that allows me to then focus in on the higher level, allows me to then solve the bigger problems. And that throughout our history, we as developers are always looking for ways to simplify that bottom part so that way we can do the bigger things, so that way we can do the tougher things. And in a lot of ways, that's 
that really is what we're seeing with AI is that it allows me to kind of stay in the zone. It allows me to uh, let the AI manage boilerplate code, manage tasks that I don't necessarily always enjoy, like, you know, maybe like writing unit tests or, or creating data models, that I can just let the, the AI do that. And then I can focus in on, on the bigger problems and, and solving those. The other very big thing is, you know, I don't know of a single organization that feels confident in their backlog and the level of, of control that they have over it. That I think most organizations, if they decided, hey, we're not going to take any new feature requests and all that we're going to do is we're going to start from the top of the backlog, work our way down, are still looking at years worth of work and years worth of effort just to try and get through what they currently have, let alone any of the new requests that are coming in. And we've seen tools like, you know, Power Apps and these different, uh, what you see is what you get kind of the drag and drop style of, of coders that have come out there and empowered, you know, power users and business users to create apps. And yet there's still this demand for developers because those skills that we have are, are still very required, are still very necessary and are going to continue to, to, to be so, I think, into the future. I think that was such a great distillation. Yeah, the WYSIWYG editors and, you know, there have been drag and drop website platforms for the last 15 years, right? And and even more last five, last 10. Um, but, you know, look, I can say we still use developers every day to help us build um, our websites and our tools, right? It just drag and drop isn't quite there yet. I'd say it's a great analogy. I also think that the refactoring that has to happen for most you know, almost every organization that has a lot of code, it's, it's, it is not, it is years. You're right, it's years. So, you know, I think that, uh, yeah, I just, and I also think that, look, there's a lot more code now, right? So there's just a lot more code that increases the demand for more people to get into this space. So there's still underemployment in the engineering space. So I would encourage anybody that is, you know, getting started in a career, if you want to go into a new career, now is a great time to go into code, only because the tools are just so powerful and you can really accelerate, I think, your time to market. What would you say to folks that are thinking about, you know, getting into software development? I <laughs> get into software development that honestly it's it it really is to me like it's 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 a fantastic career um i i in a in a lot of ways i almost can't believe that i i get paid to do this that no, uh you great. know I I, I I love being able to write code i love being able to solve problems i love being able to to come up with unique solutions and i mean don't get me wrong there are certainly frustrations. There are certainly days where I'm just banging my head against a keyboard trying to figure out why I can't get you know, some API to behave the way that I think it's it's supposed to. Um, but on the whole, like I, I really love being able to, to write code. Um, it's also a very challenging career in that, you know, it it there's a lot of how do I want to say this? It's a challenging career in that it's going to require that you look for those great solutions. It's going to require that you um, solve problems. And I, I, I think it's a good challenge to, to, to have because it really is going to test you. It's really going to like, you know, allow you to keep growing and allow you to keep learning and allow you to, to keep figuring out new things and learning new lessons. Right. Yeah, I think so. I think that, um, yeah, it's just, it's a fascinating time. And, and Christopher, we're so lucky that uh, you're a part of the Voice and AI conference. I encourage anybody that's uh, thinking about getting in development, or if you're an engineer at any level, Chris, I would say that you also, you know, you your ability to speak to somebody who's either just getting started or somebody who's actually a very highly advanced uh, developer is, 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 is notable. And it's a big part, I think, of who you are. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in where the future of code is and you uh, want to meet Christopher in person, you're going to get that chance at, at Voice and AI. And, and uh, we look so forward to seeing you there. Uh, the conference is September 5th through 7th in Washington, D.C. Come and hang out. Uh, Christopher, it's been great chatting with you. And uh, thanks again for being a speaker at Voice and AI. We look forward to seeing you and the GitHub team on site at uh, the Washington Hilton in, uh, in D.C. Yeah, I cannot wait. Thank you so very much for the opportunity. I'm looking forward to the session. I'm looking forward to, to meeting with people and, and having great conversation. So thanks again. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. 
Well, this has been Pete Erickson. Really enjoyed chatting with Christopher Harrison from GitHub. Excited to see him on site at uh, Voice and AI, Voice and dot AI, September 5th through 7th. Check it out and definitely come and join us in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much.